welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this important town hall meeting about the issues surrounding the hose company Norlight. Tonight we're going to hear from Judith Enk, a former regional administrator for the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. We're going to hear from Cohoes Mayor Bill Keeler, a resident of Saratoga Sites in, in Cohoes, Joseph Ritchie, Dr. David Carpenter from Al the Albany School of Public Health, and Dr. David Bond from Bennington College. I'm gonna start by introducing Judith Enk, who's gonna kick us off. Judith is a resident of Rensselaer County. She has spent her entire career working to protect public health and the environment. In Albany, she served as Deputy Secretary for the Environment for two governors, and President Obama appointed her to be Regional Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. After leaving the Obama administration, Judith founded a new project called Beyond Plastics, which works to eliminate plastic pollution. She is a visiting professor at Bennington College and appears on WAMC's Roundtable Public Affairs show every Friday. Um, Judith, I'd like to invite you to set the stage for us this evening. Hey, thanks, Corinne. It's great to be with you. Let me just start by saying I really miss no drama Obama. And, um, and I miss not having a, a vigorous EPA. Um, I'm known for my very sophistication, uh, sophisticated approach to literature. So I want to start by quoting from my favorite book, The Lorax. And I have a quote for all of you who have tuned in tonight. It says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And that kind of sums it up and why we're spending this beautiful summer evening uh, talking about a hazardous waste incinerator. For those of you who are on Twitter, I want to urge you to live tweet this whole forum. You're going to hear some great speakers. And feel free to follow me on Twitter, which is ENCKJ. Norlight started operating in 1956. The facility employs about 70 people in Cahos. Norlight is burning massive amounts of hazardous waste in a city, directly next to a public housing complex. It's very close to both the Hudson River and the Mohawk River. And the Salt Kill Creek runs directly through the site. That creek has not been tested by the state of New York since 2004. Prevailing winds send a great deal of the emissions through not only Cahos, but also Troy, Rensselaer County, Southern Vermont. My concerns about the operation of Norlight extend not just to public health and the environment, but also my concern rest with the workers, the 70 workers who work there. Norlight makes ceramic lightweight aggregate from shale. What is that? So there is a mining operation on the property. They take the shale and then they heat it and it becomes an aggregate material used in construction. Norlight can use gas as its heat source but it often supplements it by burning large amounts of hazardous waste. Norlight is one of only two kiln facilities like this in the entire country that produces aggregate from burning hazardous waste. So let me start. So as Corinne mentioned, I'm a former federal regulator. So let me start by putting you all to sleep by explaining a key part of the Federal Clean Air Act. It's called Maximum Achievable Control Technology. There are two categories of when MACT applies. First, for hazardous waste incinerators. The second category is cement kilns, like the Lafarge plant in Queemans or the kiln in Cahos. Important point, air pollution limits are weaker for kilns than they are for hazardous waste incinerators. So that translates into less protection for public health and the environment. So 
So in addition to the toxic firefighter foam that we'll talk about, Norlite also burns 475 different chemical descriptions, including halogenated solvents and various mixtures that are contaminated with lead. The way it works is different shipments of hazardous waste arrive mostly from New York State, 38%, 37% from Connecticut, 9% from Pennsylvania. So these tanks arrive at Norlite, and there's a chemist there who's like a mixologist. And he figures out what kind of toxic waste can be mixed with each other without allowing the facility to blow up, which is a good thing. Norlite has a history of environmental violations. Uh, they have been fined by New York Department of Environmental Conservation, DEC. They were recently fined by US Environmental Protection Agency. Because of past violations, DEC put an on-site staff person monitor who is supposed to monitor compliance with their environmental permits, and he's there 40 hours a week. This past February, I learned that Norlite was burning toxic firefighting foam. It's technically called aqueous film forming foam, which is a mouthful. Um, we in the biz call it A triple F. And what that is, is if you have a house on fire, the courageous firefighters will put it out with water. But if you have something like a tanker truck or an airplane on fire, water doesn't get the job done. So they use this foam. Unfortunately, the foam contains PFAS chemicals, a group of over 5,000 synthetic chemicals. You're probably familiar with PFOA. That's one of the PFAS chemicals that unfortunately contaminated the public water supply in Hoosick Falls, Petersburg, North Bennington, Vermont. And then PFOS contaminated the public water supply in Newburgh. And it was this toxic firefighter foam. These chemicals are called forever chemicals for a reason. They are highly persistent. They stay in our bodies for many years. And they're known to cause cancer, liver disease, autoimmune deficiencies, and infertility. The US military and the Department of Homeland Security are the largest users of this foam, about 75%. And the military stopped using it because it's so toxic and it was contaminating groundwater. And then they tried to figure out what to do with it. And for the longest time, they did, I think the responsible thing was keep it at military sites where it was stored until they could figure out a safe disposal option. So just this past February, I remember I'm driving home and I got a call from this great woman, Jane Williams, who is an air toxics expert from California. She's on the National Sierra Club clean air team. And Jane and I are kind of birds of a feather, We're very shy, retiring, we never rock the boat. And she oh. called me to tell me that are four hazardous waste incinerators in the country that have signed five-year contracts with the Department of Defense to burn um, toxic firefighting foam. She told me that uh, the environmental organization Earth Justice was filing a lawsuit um, because there was no federal environmental review, and this was done without telling anyone. The entire country learned about the situation because Jane Williams submitted a freedom of information request to the Department of Defense and learned that this burning was occurring. If not for that, I don't think we would know today that Norlight was burning waste from Department of Defense. I was quite surprised to hear this. In fact, my very professional response to Jane was, what? You're kidding. Almost everyone who works in the environmental field knows that it is not safe or sensible to burn a triple F, toxic firefighter foam. By definition, it is a fire suppressant. 
it doesn't burn well. And when you don't have complete breakdown of the chemicals being burned, it means some of these PFAS chemicals or their byproducts will be released into the air. We then learned that Norlite had been burning this material for two years with no environmental review, no test burn. And I want to, again, relax you and tell you about another part of the Clean Air Act, which is if you're an incinerator or a kiln, before you burn a new type of waste material at your facility, you are required to do a test burn to see if it, it causes problems or not. For instance, um, International Paper wanted to burn tires up on Lake Ticonderoga. The New York DEC rightly interpreted the Clean Air Act and said you have to do a test burn before you add tires. They did the test burn, they failed the test burn, and then DEC said you can't burn the tires. This didn't happen in Cohoes. There was no test burn. And I think one reason is because burning this material is so unusual, the federal EPA has not yet figured out methods on how you do a test burn for toxic firefighter foam. Just last week, New York Department of Environmental Conservation issued a statement saying that they're going to beef up their oversight of Norlite, which is good. But unfortunately, the statement also said that DEC is going to be working closely with EPA in figuring out how to do test burns. They said they're not going to do test burns in Cohoes, which means they'll probably try to do it in Ohio or Arkansas. And while I appreciate it not happening in Cohoes, I don't know why New York DEC would be trying to facilitate test burns in other states. And from an environmental justice perspective, I don't think it's wise to foist our problems on other communities. According to the Wall Street Journal, Norlite burned 2 million pounds of toxic firefighting foam in 2018 and 2019. It came to Cohoes from 25 different states. It came from 60 different military sites and then some private companies and some state agent agencies. Even the Trump Environmental Protection Agency has concerns about burning toxic firefighter foam. I read an EPA technical brief from August 2019 yeah. and it said, quote, PFAS compounds are difficult to break down due to fluorine, fluorine's electronegativity and the chemical stability of fluorinated compounds. Incomplete destruction of PFAS compounds can result in the formation of small PFAS products or products of incomplete combustion, which may not have been researched and thus could be a potential chemical of concern. And Dr. David Bond will address that in his testing. So Norlite stopped burning the toxic firefighter foam because they needed to upgrade their air pollution controls with a new scrubber system. I was surprised to learn that prior to this, Norlite was discharging 100,000 gallons of treated water every day from these scrubbers into the Mohawk River. So we learned about the previous burning in February, and then we learned that Norlite was shut down for a few months, so we had a little bit of time to breathe. The good news is that all three levels of government then swung into action. The new mayor of Cohoes, Bill Keeler, along with the Cohoes Common Council, adopted a one-year moratorium on burning toxic firefighter foam in Cohoes. And I really want to thank Mayor Keeler for his very strong leadership on this issue. At the county level, the Albany County Legislature is working on a new county level Clean Air Act. It's called Local Law B. You can remember it, B is for burning. 
that Clean Air Act would prohibit the burning of toxic firefighter foam at Norlite. It would also prohibit tire burning at Lafarge and Queemans and a few other um, waste materials. I want to thank the sponsors of the bill, county legislators Bill Reinhart, Matt Miller, Joanne Cunningham, Vicki Plotsky, and others, and urge all Albany County legislators to please sign on as co-sponsors on the county bill. And then some terrific news. Assemblymember John McDonald and State Senator Neil Breslin moved heaven and earth to pass a bill in the New York State Legislature two weeks ago that would permanently ban the burning of toxic firefighter foam at Norlight. And something remarkable happened. It passed unanimously in both houses of the legislature. But we don't know if Governor Cuomo will sign or veto the bill. So please write down these bill numbers, Senate Bill 7880 and Assembly Bill 9952. And please call or write Governor Cuomo and urge him to sign this bill into law. It really should not be that hard. It oh. seems like a fantastic place for us to acknowledge who else is on the phone. Is that okay for, for us to do? So sure. first of all, I just want to mention that we are um, I'm glad that we're joined tonight by Assemblyman John McDonald. Um, we just mentioned your bill, Assemblyman, so thank you for the work that you've done. Um, I noticed that you're here. Uh, and we also have Mayor Bill Keeler on the line. Uh, Mayor, are you, are you here with us? Can I introduce you? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so let me introduce you to Mayor Keeler. Uh, Mayor Keeler is a native Cohosier and spent a 32-year career in law enforcement, starting with the Cohos Police. He then joined the New York State Police, where he rose to the rank of Major and command commanded Troop G, which includes the Capital Region. Mayor Keeler retired from law enforcement in January of 2017, and he became the Spindle City's 40th mayor um, when he took office in January of 2020. The mayor has been working to address issues surrounding Norlite, as Judith just mentioned, since mid-February, and he led the effort to enact Local Law 4 that imposes a one-year moratorium on the incineration of AFFF in Cohoes. And I, I want to invite the mayor to um, share with us some remarks this evening. Mayor Keeler? Hi, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, I just took office in January and prior to the AFFF issue, I had recognized that the Saratoga sites uh, was an environmental justice issue because it, it's literally, there, there are 70 families that are in the shadows of the Norlite smokestacks. So back in January, I uh, invited uh, Congressman Tonko to the office and we had discussed how it was an industrial area. It really wasn't a great place for families. And we were talking about ways to relocate those folks out of that area, uh, but you know, find other places for them in Cohoes. And then uh, about a month later in mid-February, uh, Judith brought to our attention that uh, Norlite had been awarded the contract to incinerate AFFF, the firefighting foam uh, containing these PFAS chemicals. So we immediately sent letters to Governor Cuomo, to the entire U.S. congressional delegation. Uh, I think at that time, we, if I didn't send a letter, I immediately contacted John McDonald, our assemblyman, uh, to, you know, ask for information on the DOD contract, look for technical information regarding incineration of AFFF, because as Judith pointed out, uh, the, the EPA's own technical brief suggested that the incineration of AFFF might not be effective in breaking the PFAS down. So in, uh, uh, we met with, with DEC uh, in probably the third week of February, and they, they said that the AFFF was not regulated, and that uh, Norlite had burned, uh, incinerated the firefighting foam back in 2019. So we, uh, we met with the, the folks from Norlite who confirmed that yes, they had uh, a contract with DOD to incinerate AFFF. And furthermore, they advised that they had actually incinerated the firefighting foam 
as far back as 2018 in addition to 2019. So we, you know, we, we were back and forth with DEC probably in early March. They provided a list uh, indicating that two and a half million gallons of the firefighting foam had shipped from 25 states to Norlake Cahoes and that most of it, as it turns out, had been incinerated. So we subsequently had additional meetings with DEC the, in the Department of Health back in March, and our asks of them were, uh, we're looking for an administrative ban. We're looking for human and environmental testing to show us you know, what, uh, what that, the burns in 2018 and 2019, uh, what effects they may have had. On the on the soil, uh, on, the, on the salt kill watershed, on the on the people in the area, and uh, the third ask was we're looking for help, uh, you know, relocating Saratoga sites residents. So in April, uh, Cohoes passed a local law putting a one-year moratorium on incinerating a triple F in the city, and by May we had actually gotten a report that 58,000 a gallon. This is after the law had had passed that 58,000 gallons of the AFFF uh, firefighting foam was en route to Norlake Cahoes uh, for, uh, presumably for incineration. So again, calls to the congressional delegation, calls to DEC, the governor's office, uh, Assemblyman McDonald, Senator Breslin, and subsequently, uh, uh, Senator Breslin and uh, Assemblyman McDonald were able to get the, the bill passed in the Senate and the Assembly that would prohibit the incineration in New York State if the governor signs it. Uh, Norlate has since told us that they canceled the contracts with DOD and DO, DEC has announced an administrative ban on the incineration of, of the firefighting foam uh, so that's pretty much where we are and, and what we did with the information. But again, thanks to Judith for, for initially making us aware of it back in February, for Assemblyman McDonald and Senator Breslin, uh, who have been in this fight with us, you know, from day one. Mayor, thank you so much for providing us with that context, and I hope you'll stay on the line for some questions. Um, just a, sure. a reminder. Or, thank you. A reminder for participants tonight, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We'll be collecting questions and asking our panelists to address them at the end. You can also type in your questions on the Facebook Live. Um, we'll be looking for questions there as well. And thank you for uh, all of these great questions that are coming in. Um, I want to introduce you next to Joe Ritchie. Joseph Ritchie is a student at Syracuse University. He is a resident of Saratoga Sites, which is right near the Norlite facility. He's a lifelong community advocate and has been following the issues surrounding Norlite for quite some time. Um, Joe, I'm gonna ask you to, to speak. Yes, uh, thank you for everyone for having us and everyone that's sponsoring and all the people who are willing to spend their summer afternoon on a environmental advocacy call. It's really awesome. So I'll just give you some background on who I am and you know what I've been doing in the past few months. So I'm a lifelong resident of Saratoga Sites. I've lived here for 19 years. I'm going to be 20 next month, so my whole life. Um, and I've always cared about the environment ever since I was younger. You know, I'd visit my grandfather's in the Adirondacks, enjoy the lakes, and really appreciate what nature is. Um, I found out in February, just like everybody else, that Norlite was burning these harmful chemicals. And I said, this, is, this isn't right, because we've learned a couple of years ago in Hoosick Falls what, what happened there with contamination there, um, and it wasn't great. And Norlite has been an issue for my community for, for a very long time, since the 50s. Um, and they've been fined, they've been you know, told they're doing a bad job, but they really haven't been punished to to the degree that would seem fit. You know, they're a multi-million dollar company um, and they can afford $300,000 $300, fines, $200,000 fines. And the residents of Saratoga sites have not seen a single dime of those, of those fines. I know there's legality along where those fines should go, but regardless, 
you know, I'm trying to be here as an advocate for all of Saratoga Sites residents because everyone has a lot going on, especially right now through coronavirus. People are working, trying to put bread on the table. And that's why I'm here so I can get the information out and just spread it along people that live here. And not, not, not necessarily just Saratoga Sites, but there's also private homeowners across the street that I've been in contact with. There's also another apartment complex. There's a speedway. There's where people eat hot dog Charlie's, they eat. Um, and people are raising their children here. And it's not fundamentally right for this company to be here. They should never have been here. Uh, we can you know, discuss why they were here um, a long time ago. That's a different issue. But the residents of Saratoga sites have been facing environmental injustices for decades. This isn't a new issue. Um, children can't enjoy the snow in the winter time because it's, it has a black soot on it. You can literally see it after a week after it snows, the snow becomes black. Um, our cars, if we wash them, the, the, the cars become black. If we go out and get the mail while they were burning consistently, you start gagging. It smells like all your worst chemicals being burnt into a, into a bin. More action needs to be done. I'm very grateful for all the work that's been done in the Assembly and State Senate. And I'm hoping that you know, the governor signs on to this bill but ultimately, we need to work forward to the ultimate goal of hopefully ceasing operation in Norlite. That's my life's goal right now, is to focus head on on what we can do to shut this, shut this thing down because we have to make the bold steps in order to be a bold leading community. You know, Cohoes signed on to a deal that they said they want to be a green community. They want to be with the state's agenda for a green city. Let's be bold and let's make those decisions together thoughtfully and in a smart way, not doing things out of passion, but doing things out of science. The science is really important. And also that there's people that live 500 yards. If I look out my window, there's Norlight. So, you know, that's pretty much what I have to say for right now. Joe, yeah. thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we'll have some Time for questions of uh, Judith, the mayor, and Joe. After we hear from our next two speakers, I want to remind participants that you can type your question in the chat box. And we've already got a number of really interesting questions for our discussion. Um, I'm going to in, uh, introduce you next to Dr. David Carpenter. David O. Carpenter is a public health physician who previously served as the director of the Wadsworth Laboratories of the New York State Department of Health, and then as Dean of the School of Public Health at the University at Albany. His research interests are environmental causes of human disease. Dr. Carpenter, I'd like to turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Corrine. Let me tell you a little more about these chemicals. These are called porphyrinated chemicals because they're primarily carbon atoms that have fluorines attached to them. As Judith mentioned, the ones that we've known for the longest time are PFOA, that's at Hoosick Falls, PFOS, that's at uh, a number of military bases, and it's a major component of this firefinding foam. Now, those two compounds have been studied for a long time, and they've been voluntarily withdrawn by most manufacturers in this country. But what the manufacturers have done in the meantime is change the length of the carbon chains or add some component into that structure so that it does more or less the same thing. It's water repellent, it's stain resistant, but nobody has studied whether or not it's dangerous. Now, when you burn firefighting foam that contains chemicals that suppress fire, nobody knows what is the product. And as Judith mentioned, there are all of these products of incomplete combustion. Now, incinerators have long been used for, for getting rid of hazardous waste. And that's a real problem in our society. We generate this hazardous waste, and then what do you do about it? Because you have to get rid of it somehow. So uh, incineration, if it's done properly, can work for some hazardous chemicals. Uh, the ones that I've worked with most are PCBs and dioxins. They are rather like these perforinated compounds, but they contain chlorines, not fluorines. 
And then there's another class of nasty chemicals that are called the brominated flame retardants. And these are chemicals sprayed on our upholstery, our curtains and so forth that reduce the, the rapidity with which the, the fabric will burn. All of these compounds have a whole series of human health effects. But the problem is the fluorine bound, the fluorine carbon bound is much stronger than the chlorine carbon or the bromine carbon. These are all halogen items. The reason that these are called forever chemicals is that in the environment and in our bodies, they stay for a long time. If you are exposed to these compounds today, you'll have half of them in your body at least seven years from now. And then another half will get rid of in the next seven years. Okay, so what are the health effects? Well, as people that have been involved in the Hoosick Falls situation know, these chemicals cause cancer and they specifically cause at least three kinds of cancer, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and bladder cancer. We know a lot about that because uh, DuPont had a factory in West Virginia that contaminated bodies of water there. And as part of the settlement, there were major studies of the diseases those people have. All right, but that was when the chemicals were sort of dumped into the water. What's happening at Norlite? They're burning them. The chemicals that are not completely combusted are going into the air and people are going to breathe them. And also when they come out of the air, they're going to deposit in the ground, contaminating the soil. They're going to get in the water, contaminating the water and the fish. Now I have a project funded by the National Institutes of Health where we're looking at these compounds in Alaska natives on St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, off the coast of Nome. Obviously no industry up there. Those people have as high a level of these compounds as most people in the lower 48. And that is all because of air transport of these compounds. So nobody should minimize the importance of inhalation, especially if you live around a plant that's burning these chemicals and probably not doing it efficiently. Now, one big issue is the temperature in the plant and the length of time that these chemicals are exposed. Uh, from all that I know, to get complete combustion of these compounds, you should have a, a temperature of 1400 degrees centigrade. From everything I've been told, the maximum temperature at Norlite is something like 800 degrees centigrade. So right there, you can be pretty sure there's not going to be complete combustion. All right, go back to the health effects. Cancer. One of the big concerns that I think is particularly timely is that these compounds as a class suppress our immune system. And there have been studies from Denmark that show that children that are immunized do not respond to the immunization as, as effectively if they're exposed to perfluorinated compounds. In this day and age of COVID-19, if and when we get a vaccine, if you are inhaling these compounds, if they're in the soil in your yard and they get in your vegetables or in your fish, the last thing you want is to not have that vaccine be as efficient as it would be if you were not exposed. These compounds cause liver disease, they cause kidney disease, they cause respiratory disease. Uh, and of course, the issue is that, as Judith said, there's some 5,000 of these different chemicals. And so there've been a few studies of individual chemicals. Uh, not all of the individual chemicals do exactly the same thing. So we have this gamish of toxic chemicals, many of which have never been even studied scientifically. And there is zero reason to think that any of these are without hazardous effects to people. So what is the solution? Well, the first solution is don't let people be exposed to these chemicals. Whether it's by breathing the air, uh, having their food contaminated, their fish contaminated, their soil contaminated. And then 
of course we need more research, but we definitely need regulation. The precautionary principle says we will not allow things to be put upon us when there's a reasonable degree of question about whether they're toxic, even if we don't have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. These are toxic chemicals. They don't burn very well. We should not be incinerating them in Cohoes or anywhere else. How we get rid of them, that's another question. But this is definitely not a safe way to get rid of them and poses significant hazard to human health. Thank you very much. Dr. Carpenter, thank you so much for your uh, remarks. I'm sure that there will be questions for you when we turn to the question and answer period of this program. Uh, I'd like to next invite Dr. David Bond to join us. Dr. Bond teaches environmental studies at Bennington College, where he directs the Understanding PFOA project that tries to link up with scientific resources of colleges with community concerns around PFAS, PFAS contamination. In March, David and his team took water and soil samples from around Norlight and analyze them for PFAS compounds. He will discuss the results of that research tonight, and then I'm sure we'll have some questions for him. Dr. Bond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen, and, and thanks uh, to all of those who've worked so hard to bring us together uh, for this really urgent uh, conversation. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's joined us uh, as we learn new ways to pursue environmental justice uh, during a pandemic. Uh, and it's, uh, we can't all be in the same place, but it's really great to see, see everyone gathered here together. Uh, so my name is David Bond, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for the Advancement of Public Action at Huntington <laughs> College. Uh, after PFOA was detected in alarming levels in the drinking water of Hoosick Falls and hundreds of residential wells in New York and Vermont, I started the Understanding PFOA Project at Bennington College. Since 2016, and with the support of the National Science Foundation, we have been working to make the growing scientific concerns about the dangers of PFAS contamination. Uh, scientific concerns that are often written in a highly technical language uh, and published behind paywalls. We've worked to make that science more accessible to impacted communities. There, there's often a disjuncture between the, the growing scientific concern uh, about the real danger that this class of chemical poses uh, and the places that are, that are asking urgent questions about these chemicals. Uh, and so we've, we've tried to work to bridge the science uh, and the places uh, impacted by these chemicals. Each year we also take a few concerns from residents uh, and turn them into an exploratory research project uh, where we try to produce independent data for communities trying to navigate the discovery of these, of these uh, chemicals in their community. Uh, looking at everything from is there any PFOA in maple sap, there was, uh, to sort of the local community's knowledge uh, of its own health uh, in relation uh, to PFAS contamination. When everything at Norlight came to light, uh, we decided to build a research project around the questions uh, that many residents were starting to ask. What's coming out of the stacks? when PFAS chemicals are being burned. A little bit of background just to sort of go through how we got to this, uh, this study we did uh, this past March. Um, as others have summarized, for at least two years, Norlite attempted to burn a staggeringly large amount of the toxic firefighting foam AFFF. In 2018 and 2019, hundreds of tanker cars of AFFF arrived in the capital district coming in from as far away as North Dakota, Texas, and West Virginia. What is AFFF? Perfluorinated compounds like PFOA and PFOS, the same chemicals that contaminated Hoosick Falls and Newburgh. These chemicals are the main ingredients of AFFF. The engineered properties of perfluorinated compounds makes them nearly indestructible. And once released, these toxins never break down. Literally, they never break down, leading many environmental advocates to refer to them as forever chemicals. Once released, they never break down, but they don't always stay put. They're highly mobile, 
and they bioaccumulate. Uh, these, these sort of properties, the indestructibility of these toxins, their mobility in the environment, and the way that they bioaccumulate make them a real challenge, a new kind of challenge uh, for environmental uh, regulation and environmental justice. These same properties also, their, their sheer durability and ability to withstand degradation have made PFAS compounds extraordinarily effective at putting out industrial or jet fuel fires, which is how they got you know, brought into AFFF. And AFFF now is a firefighting foam uh, that uses the chemical properties of perfluorinated compounds to fight industrial and jet fuel fires, really tricky fires to fight. So as, as others have sort of indicated, if you think burning a toxin engineered to suppress fire is completely ludicrous, you're not alone. It also flies in the face of the best science and the best regulatory expertise that we have. Although incineration breaks down many hazardous chemicals, there is no evidence that it eradicates PFAS compounds. Again, there is no evidence that incineration breaks these toxins down. Here's how the EPA put it in 2019, quote, the effectiveness of incineration to destroy PFAS compounds is not well understood. The EPA report continued, our grasp of the quote, thermal destructibility, the ability of fire to destroy, our grasp of the thermal destructibility of PFAS is sparse, thinly extrapolated and inoperable. This past April, only a few months ago, in another EPA presentation summarized a new concern. Burning AFFF may not only not destroy these compounds, it may in fact produce new toxic perfluorinated chemicals that we don't even know how to detect yet. The kiln may in fact act like a witch's cauldron, conjuring up new chemical afflictions. While the proper way to dispose of these forever chemicals, the chemicals in AFFF, is debated, the dangers they pose to human health is not. There is no debate about the risk these chemicals pose to human health. Exposure to trace amounts of PFAS chemicals in AFFF is strongly linked to a host of cancers, developmental disorders, immune dysfunction, and infertility. Several states, including New York, have banned the use of AFFF over these health concerns around the PFAS compounds in AFFF. That's why they banned AFFF for these very things. Despite striking knowledge gaps and clear public health risks, Norlite poured over 2 million pounds of AFFF into its furnaces in 2018 and 2019. A fundamental question hangs over this operation. If incineration is an unproven means of destroying these toxins, what happened? What happened when they tried to burn 2 million pounds of AFFF? Is Norlite solving this problem by incinerating it or simply redistributing these toxins into poor and working class neighborhoods in Cohoes, or perhaps even the capital district? That scale of contamination is not out of line with thinking about, about the uh, plants that emit PFAS compounds. Um, indeed, there's, there's new evidence coming out of how far uh, these, these PFAS compounds go when they're emitted from a plant and elevate levels in soil and water. So for example, the ChemFab plant in Merrimack, New Hampshire, uh, which emitted uh, perfluorinated compounds for a little over a decade, contaminated groundwater in New Hampshire for over a hundred square miles, bringing the groundwater over uh, the health, uh, health levels for drinking water, over a hundred square miles area. The three plastics plant that dot our region, my region, Hoosick Falls, Petersburg, and Bennington, together emitted PFOA that we've detected in an area of about 175 square miles, that we see elevated levels in the soil downwind of those plastics plants. There was a new report that just came out a few weeks ago uh, about the Comores plants, uh, one of the main producers of these chemicals in West Virginia, that found emissions from this plant. Again, a stack that's supposed to burn these things, uh, that emissions from that stack 
polluted water and soil 25 miles downwind of that plant. So emissions are, 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 are a growing concern uh, as a source uh, of, of the, uh, how these chemicals get into our soil and water and our environment. Uh, so given the questions around, around this, uh, you know, that, that are neither uh, unreasonable nor impossible to answer, uh, is what's coming out of the stacks when Norlite burns HFLF. Uh, the, the fact uh, you know, that it's taken two years for this question to come to public light demonstrates just how poorly the disposal of these forever chemicals uh, is being managed today. Given the significance of these, of these questions, Bennington College designed an exploratory research project to look at PFAS levels around Norlite. In early March, a team of professors and students uh, took three soil and four surface water samples from relatively undisturbed sites in the neighborhoods around the incinerator, uh, including the Saratoga Sites public housing complex that literally sits in the shadows of Norlite. We had a commercial lab analyze these samples for a wide array of perfluorinated compounds. The full results of our research can be found on our website, www.bennington.edu PFOA. What we found is concerning. The soil and surface waters around Norlite are laced with PFAS compounds commonly found in AFFF. While our research is preliminary, the pattern of contamination that we identified mirrors the composition of AFFF. Nine of the 10 PFAS compounds detected in a pond adjacent Norlite are key ingredients or breakdown products of AFFF. A few hours after we shared our preliminary findings, New York State DEC rejected them out of hand and refused our calls for more research, stating, quote, there is no basis to conduct additional sampling at Norlite. This is a striking assertion. Under the watchful eye of a full-time on-site DEC monitor, Norlite burned at least 2 million pounds of AFFF over the past two years with no scientific monitoring to ensure that incineration was actually destroying these toxic chemicals. Is DEC afraid of what it might now found, find if it looks uh, around Norlite? As we said when we first released our data, DEC needs to do its own testing and share the results with the public. Our study is the first in the nation to analyze PFAS levels in soil and water outside a facility burning AFFF. That in itself is a shocking finding. Uh, the, the burning has gone on for some time now. Nobody has looked to see what happens after you burn AFFF. This is a huge knowledge gap with massive public health implications uh, and ground zero for this question happens to be in Cohoes, New York. Pre we, it's the first study to look at this. However, previous environmental research has examined PFAS contamination in groundwater where AFFF has been used extensively like Air Force bases or training centers or firefighters. The patterns of PFAS contamination we found around Norlite resembles patterns of contamination detected at these sites of extensive AFFF use. This distinct pattern of PFAS contamination differs from the more general pattern of PFAS contamination we found elsewhere in our region. We've taken hundreds of samples from groundwater, surface water, and soils all across New York and Vermont. In almost every sample we, we take, we see the same uh, pattern of PFAS contamination and in almost every sample, PFOA is the most prevalent compound. It's the, it's the, it's the one we see the most in, in, in the highest levels. Around Norlite, PFOA falls to the wayside as other compounds become the most prevalent. Compounds like PFBS, PFBEA, PFHXA, and PFBA. Those are the compounds that were the most prevalent around Norlite. While not yet household names, these compounds are key ingredients in AFFF and likely share the same toxicological profile as PFOA. This distinct pattern of PFAS contamination around Norlite declines with distance from the incinerator. Far from destroying AFFF, the Norlite facility appears to be raining down a witch's brew of toxic perfluorinated compounds onto the poor and working class neighborhoods of Cohoes, New York. While we were collecting samples, we ran into a number of residents uh, at the Saratoga sites, many of whom complained to us of being tear gassed in their home. 
AFFF has a unique chemical fingerprint. That chemical fingerprint can now be lifted off the landscapes and neighborhoods around Norlite and perhaps even across the entire capital district. A more comprehensive investigation is urgently needed to determine the full extent of PFAS contamination around Norlite. And until there's scientific consensus about how to safely dispose of these toxic chemicals, all incineration of PFAS compounds must be banned. Environmental justice and public health depends on it. Thank you. Dr. Bond, thank you so much for those remarks. We have so many terrific questions coming in. I want to encourage uh, the news outlets that are on this uh, in this town hall meeting to submit any questions that you'd like. Um, we've got some, some kids from the area that are appreciating all of the panelists. They're appreciating everything that they're learning from what you're saying. Uh, a lot of community members. I want to start out um, because we do have Assemblyman John McDonald uh, in our town hall meeting tonight as a as a as a as a listener. Um, but Judith Enk mentioned the bill that was passed unanimously by the Assembly and the Senate, and awaiting the governor's signature. And I'd like to ask Assemblymember McDonald to say a few words about what he knows about where Governor Cuomo stands on this issue and the outlook for whether this bill will become law. Assemblymember McDonald? Just unmute yourself. Thank you, Corrine, and I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, as you know, the governor has a pretty good track record when it comes to the environment. And um, last week, Senator Breslin and myself had a rather lengthy conversation with the Deputy Secretary for Environment, as well as the governor's chief counsel. Um, the good news is on the structure of the bill, the bill is straightforward. Many people don't realize we actually amended the bill at the last moment to move from a statewide bill um, to a local bill because we were only considering local bills when we were in session a couple of weeks ago. That's why we're at this point right now. We were able to move quickly on that aspect, and I thank Judith um, for her counsel advice during that process. Uh, they are going to review the bill. Um, they did mention that their largest concern, which Dr. Carpenter actually referenced a little bit too, and it should be a concern of all of us, is what is the long-term, what is the best long-term way to address this waste stream? Which is a legitimate issue. We don't want it accumulating in our landfills and leaking out in society. That being said, that's something we all can collectively work together on, but the same token, we want the governor to sign the bill. And um, the good news is Bill and his team at Cajos, the council took the correct step first to give us a little bit of a window to breathe. Uh, so we've got until next April, but. I'm hopeful over the next two or three weeks that we start to get some motion. But right now they have not indicated they would veto the bill by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but they did not indicate that they are going to pass the bill yet. So I think they're noodling it. And I think as was referenced earlier, if some voices could be raised to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member. Um, I want to encourage people to follow the Sanctuary for Independent Media on social media. Um, you'll see that we'll have some action alerts. We'll have some information about how you can get involved at the end of this town hall, ways to contact the governor, ways to take action. Um, just keep paying attention like you are for ways to get involved. Um, the next question coming in is for the scientists. You know, we heard from Joe uh, and we've heard from a number of people commenting on Facebook and in the chat box that we don't want these chemicals being burned near our homes. We don't want these chemicals being burned near our water sources. Um, but what do you do? What is the alternative uh, to handling AFFF? A triple F, what are the alternatives to, to PFAS and the other chemical compounds? What are some options for handling these chemicals that are that would be safer? What do we do with them? We're producing them. What do we now do with them? Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Bond, do either one of you want to start us out with that question? Well, I'll start. Uh, you know, we, we make a number of very dangerous chemicals, and then when we find out how dangerous they are, we don't know what to do with them take PCBs in the Hudson River. Well, they could be burned. And uh, the only problem is that there's so much contaminated sediment that it's very expensive. And if you burn soil, you, you burn all uh, organic material. So what, what's happens with them? Well, they get 
shift to some other state, usually Texas, and they get put in a secure landfill. Now, that's a, a good temporary solution, but it's not a permanent solution because when those chemicals are put in a landfill uh, and it's contained and covered, they will not degrade at all forever. And 100 years from now, someone forget that there's a landfill there and they'll dig a foundation for a home. But I think that in the short term, for the, this firefighting form, that is probably the best alternative. To put it in a secure landfill with clear uh, prohibition of people getting, uh, digging down in it and just getting it away from people but it's not optimal. We really need to be able to destroy these compounds, but we don't have cost-effective ways of doing that. Corinne, if, if, I, could, if I could just add, um, yes, I, I, it, we know the worst thing to do is burn it. So it's kind of puzzling that we've gone right to the worst thing. So we need a state law, a county law, a local law, all three on the books saying you can't burn this material. 75% of this is generated from Department of Defense. The Pentagon has a very large budget. When I was the EPA regional administrator, I would often do meetings at the Pentagon. Um, they never ended well, um, but I was amazed at, at the um, opulence of the Pentagon. It did not look anything like the EPA office. And it reminded me that they have resources. They have an R&D budget. And I wanna share an example involving the Bluegrass Army Depot in Kentucky a number of years ago. Now remember, the military has a lot of difficult waste streams that they have to dispose of. A number of years ago, they had chemical weapons on rockets that they needed to dispose of. And they tried to bring it to the Bluegrass Army Depot in Kentucky to burn at an incinerator. The local residents organized, just like what's happening in Cohoes, they got some allies, a guy named Mitch McConnell and others helped them block this. And instead, the Department of Defense put a lot of money into research and development and they identified a supercritical water oxidation unit, which destroys the chemical weapons without incinerating it and putting the emissions into the atmosphere. The bad news is it took, um, it took $1 billion and 15 years for them to figure it out. But the Department of Defense R&D budget is significantly larger than the New York State DEC budget and the city of Cohoes budget. And I think what our state regulators need to do is work with Department of Defense on better disposal options that do not include incineration. Thanks, Judith. Uh, we've got some commenters that were mentioning the uh, super, what is it, the super critical water oxidation. So right. uh, mm -hmm. we've got some, some folks talking about that in the chat. Dr. Bond, do you have anything you want to add to this question of how we address um, getting rid of these yep. dangerous chemicals? It's a great question, and, and it's a question that should have been asked before they were put into wide circulation. Uh, and, and this is one of the shortcomings of our current sort of way of regulating toxins, is we often wait till it's a massive public problem to start asking that question. Uh, we need to ask those questions at the get-go, uh, before new chemicals are allowed to go into sort of wide circulation. Uh, and sort of exemplifies so many of the problems we have uh, in our regulation of toxics right now. Uh, there, there are ways to break these chemicals down in laboratories, uh, but many of them don't scale up yet uh, to, to, to the scale of contamination we're seeing uh, at, in some of these areas. Um, as Judith is saying, others are saying, it, it's going to require a massive investment uh, in new technologies to begin to figure that out, and that needs to happen yesterday. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, incineration is absolutely the worst way uh, to do it. We have them, these chemicals fairly contained in barrels and other things right now. Uh, when we're incinerating them, we're risking sort of taking those barrels and spreading them all over the landscape, uh, which creates a problem that boggles the mind to try to figure out how you would go about cleaning that up. Uh, so in the, in the short term, uh, stop burning them. <laughs> 
Just, we've got some information coming through on the chat. Um, someone, Mike, is likening the super critic, critical water oxidation to a giant Instapot. It's like a crock pot on steroids, a modern pressure cooker that is affordable and low tech. So I, I love this chat that's going on in the sidebar. Um, another question here, and this one I think is for Judith. Judith, can we hear a little bit more about EPA's recent enforcement case against Norlite? Yes, so EPA announced the settlement of an enforcement case against Norlite on May 22nd. They made a point of saying that the EPA investigation uh, did not include the burning of AFFF. And I think this is important because it turns us now toward the rest of the operation at Norlite. I don't want people to think that if you stop burning AFFF, we're out of the woods. I looked at the EPA documents. They are mind numbing to read, but I encourage everyone to read them. The January complaint and then the final settlement. Uh, EPA fined Norlite a measly $150,000. We'll put that aside. What's more important is this legal settlement looks, it, it's a roadmap for serious operational problems at Norlite. I wanna focus on three quick things. One, the EPA investigation found significant violations of the dioxin and furan emission limits. You know dioxin to be the most toxic chemical known to science. It was put in Agent Orange. According to EPA, Norlite repeatedly and consistently from 2012 to 2014 violated its temperature restrictions for approximately 38,900 hours. And the temperature is crucial in terms of whether dioxin and furans are created when they're leaving the stack. Second major finding by the EPA, they found significant violations of acid gases in particulate emissions. There are two kilns at Norlite. They were operating for almost 2 million hours with the scrubber tank level below the minimum 58% of tank height. They also did not maintain minimum pressure drop across the wet scrubber for about 1.5 million hours. Collectively, all of these scrubber violations would have increased heavy metal emissions, particulate emissions, and acid gas emissions throughout the capital district. And third, and I'm only giving you the top three, there's a whole lot more in this legal settlement. Third, Norlite failed to do the required test burns on both of its kilns. The Clean Air Act requires that you burn, that you do test burns every 61 months. And they only did that on one kiln, not both. And I think the the big question for me is it's not clear if Norlite is currently in compliance with the Clean Air Act separate from the toxic firefighting foam issue. And so I want to leave you with the understatement of the year. This is not a well-run facility. Thank you, Judith. And we're going to come back to that in a moment, but we've got another interesting question. Dr. Carpenter mentioned that um, this pollution could make a vaccine for COVID-19 less effective. Does anyone on the panel know whether there are any other COVID-19 related effects? We know that COVID-19 effect, affects your respiratory um, function. So what are some other things that we ought to be concerned about in the current global pandemic? Well, anyone that has uh, exposure to significant air pollution will end up with respiratory problems. And there's very strong documentation that if you have pre-existing respiratory disease, you are much more likely to die from COVID infection. I don't think there's any evidence that it increases your risk of being infected, but any pre-existing disease is likely to, to uh, make it more likely that you're going to die. And clearly air pollution and, and Judith just mentioned all these other things coming out of the stack. The, the dioxins, the metals, 
metals don't go away. They're elements. You can't burn metals. And, you know, if there is not the adequate scrubbing in these stacks, that's what we have all of these scrubbles for, scrubbles for. And all the water that goes in there is to catch things that would otherwise be spewed out in the community and, and, and keep them from going out. But uh, by its nature, emissions from stacks of incinerators create air pollution. And that air pollution can be particulates, it can be acid gases, it can be uh, nitric oxide, sulfur oxides, a whole variety of things, including toxic metals and very toxic dioxins, who also suppress immune system function. Ryan, if I could just add real quickly, um, there was a study by Harvard School of Public Health released just this past April, and the study found that coronavirus patients in areas that had high levels of air pollution before the pandemic are more likely to die from the infection than patients in cleaner parts of the country. This was a nationwide study. It was the first clear link between long-term exposure to pollution and COVID-19 death rates, and it particularly focused on particulate matter. Thank you, Judith. Dr. Bond, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. There's a lot of really great information coming in through the chat um, that I would, I would encourage people to take a look at. Dr. Bond, anything to add? Both things were already mentioned that I had. Okay, great. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about when we knew what we know now um, and, and what don't we know about what could have been happening at Norlight prior to 2018. Um, so that question in connection with can, any be, can anyone be held criminally liable for that? We've been talking about legislation, both local and at the state level, that could ban this. We've been talking about EPA enforcement. But can anyone be held criminally liable for these, uh, for the failure to investigate what the health impacts might have been? Does anyone want to address that question? Well, I think there's ample evidence that any industrial facility that releases chemicals into the environment that cause human disease can be held liable for that. Now it's not a, it's a steep road to climb, hill to climb, but uh, yes, uh, I think Norlite itself would be liable. Uh, the complication here is that all of this came from the Defense Department contracts. It's very difficult to sue the US government, but uh, certainly well, someone should be liable for uh, adverse health effects if they're really documented in the residents that live near the site. So I hope well, whoever if I could just, Corinne, if I could just add, most of it came from Department of Defense, not all of it. And I think the question is, could you sue Norlite or their operators? Most environmental enforcement in this country is civil. However, there, there are criminal laws that could be investigated. When I was at EPA, most of our criminal work was asbestos uh, related or lead poisoning related. However, I do want to mention that when I was regional administrator, we brought a civil and criminal case against Tonawanda Coke, a petroleum coke plant in western New York, and we sent the plant manager to jail for a couple years because of the serious contamination problem, both water and air, and that case was brought by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Western New York. The way it works is if you do it at the state level, the DEC would refer to the Attorney General's Office. It's kind of like law and order. The police investigate the crime and the district attorney uh, prosecutes the crime. That's what I'm doing at home, watching lots of reruns of law and order. And then at the federal level, it's EPA would refer to Department of Justice. So um, there's nothing standing in the way of the DEC or the EPA doing a criminal investigation if they wanted to. I'm not aware of anything like that underway. Another question that we're getting is whether the city of Cohoes, and maybe this is a, a question for the mayor, could the city of Cohoes help coordinate a class action suit for all present and pre previous residents within a reasonable distance 
from the site. As uh, Saratoga Sites resident Joe Ritchie stated, we shouldn't stop at uh, ceasing the incineration. There, there should be some, um, some kind of, uh, you know, addressing this from citizens, a multi-million dollar lawsuit for damages to health and property. Mayor Keeler, are you still on the line? Is this something you'd like to address? It's my understanding that a law firm or a couple of law firms are uh, you know, proactively reaching out to the folks down at Saratoga sites to initiate a class action lawsuit. Uh, that's, you know, that's something that they're doing separate and apart from the city. I mean, I, I think the, the city did, you know, as far as the moratorium, they did what, uh, you know, I feel that we had to do. And then, uh, you know, as far as civil action through the courts, uh, through the attorneys, uh, you know, that ball sounds like it's already rolling, separate and apart from what the city did. Do you have any suggestions for folks that are participating in this town hall for how they might find, how they might connect with those law firms? Uh, maybe Joe Ritchie can answer that question because he was probably contacted. I've talked to a couple of people at Saratoga sites that uh, said that they were contacted. So I, I imagine Joe has been contacted so he may have the law firm's business card or contact information thanks mayor um joe are you still with us can you answer that question i am um and yes i can answer it uh you could just contact me and i can give you all the relevant information um because there is there is something in the works um and you know if you want to be a part of it uh you know contact me i can write my number in the uh, chat um and also my email um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of things to be done. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, another interesting question here from Mary Kr uh, Krinczewski, is Norlite required to reveal what chemicals and mixtures are being incinerated? What, uh, we've answered the question a little bit of what else is being burned at Norlite. Are there safety data sheets available for the public to view regarding shipments of waste burned at the company? Dr. Carpenter or Dr. Bond or maybe Judith? I don't know. Judith, do you know the answer to that question? Um, Mike Ewall from Energy Justice Network is on this call and he did a lot of digging. It wasn't easy, but he found the hundreds of chemicals that have been burnt there. Can we um, unmute Mike and ask him to explain this? Mike, are you with us? Can you unmute your mic? I'm the moderator, I mean, the uh, tech folks will unmute your mic as well. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, so yeah, I dug into the EPA database. I mentioned some of this in the chat, if those of you can read that. Um, but there's a database called the Biennial Reporting System, and that reports all the hazardous waste shipments around the country and who is processing or burning what that's where I pulled up the data from 2017 that is the latest data available. Um, there's data for 2015, 13, et cetera, every two years. And that data showed 476 chemicals that they were burning, um, showed how much um, from which states and where, what sources they were coming from. One of the especially alarming things I noticed in there, of course, it didn't mention AFFF, which apparently that wasn't being burned yet, um, but it did mention about 10 tons of chemicals containing lead and many more tons of chemicals containing halogens, which are like fluorine, which is in the AFFF, but also chlorine and bromine, those sorts of chemicals. These are the most dangerous things that you can possibly burn. And when I looked at the emissions data, the latest data I got out of a FOIL request from the state DEC, which is 2018's data, I looked at their emissions of lead and um, I also looked at 2017 so we can compare the same year. Well, they burned 10 tons of stuff containing lead, but only had a fraction of a pound, a small fraction of a pound of lead emissions, which tells me that they are not testing on the days that they're burning lead compounds because there's no way their emissions would be as low as they said, no matter what controls they have, especially with what Judith told us, Judith told us about how poorly they're um, running their air pollution control devices. So when I added all this up, I found it's about 1% of what they burn 
is stuff that has lead or halogen compounds in it. That's something that I think if you were to allow them to keep burning hazardous waste at all, which is um, something that shouldn't be done, but if you were to do that, I would say at least that 1% of these especially dangerous chemicals in addition to the firefighting foam is something that should not be allowed to be burned. Um, they are not required to continuously emission, sorry, to continuously monitor their emissions for toxic chemicals. There is the technology to monitor lead and acid gases and other toxic chemicals like dioxins on a continuous basis, but no one requires it in the US except for a handful of places where I've written local laws like the one in Queemans that got passed requiring at the local level. Um, so that's something also that would be important, especially if they will continue to burn this stuff to make sure that they test every day, not um, just once a year on best behavior when they can control which things they're burning. Mike, thank you so much for popping in and, and providing that context. I appreciate it. I want to um, address one more question before we um, close this up. And Terry Malloy on Facebook is asking, how have these chemicals been transported and then stored at Norlite? Does that in and, in and of itself present a risk? Does someone want to take that question? I believe it mostly comes by truck. And I am not familiar with how it is stored on site. Maybe a similar question um, for those of, of us that are my age and maybe older, uh, you think about the burning of nuclear waste. And I guess there are some folks that are questioning, is this akin to, is it worse than burning nuclear waste? What, what level of, you know, I guess that people are thinking, should my level of concern be heightened because it's worse than burning nuclear waste? Well, th there's nothing worse than burning nuclear waste because the radioactive elements are just that, they're elements. They are not consumed by fire. So uh, this doesn't correspond to that uh, at all, gotcha. but that doesn't make it any, it doesn't make it safe and it's clearly dangerous. Mm -hmm. Let me ask one question as I was thinking about some of our previous discussion, if you have another 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, I've just recently been involved in a number of legal cases where Monsanto is being sued because of PCB contamination in schools, in other cases, people that have certain cancers. Monsanto made all the PCBs. Who makes firefighting foam? Is it DuPont? Is it 3M? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you know, Monsanto has been losing cases right and left. The, the states in the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, and California are suing Monsanto because of contamination of their boundary waters. Uh, as I said, I was just involved in this case. I was deposed last week uh, of a school that had high levels of PC contamination because of PCBs in clock and light ballast. Now, obviously, Monsanto was a long way away from how it was used, but that's been a root of litigation that's been practiced quite often. Thanks so there are multiple that. responsible parties here. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. The New York Attorney General's Office and the Vermont Attorney General's Office is suing, I think, some of the manufacturers. Um, I know there's contamination in Cairo, New York, in Greene County, and Attorney General Tish James has announced some litigation there. I think it's going after the manufacturers, but we can double check that, David. That's a really good point. Well, the critical issue is, did the manufacturer know that it was dangerous at the time they manufactured it? Sometimes yeah. the manufacturers didn't know, but if they did know, and I know in the case of 3M, I reviewed records of their employees 25 years ago, uh, if the manufacturer knew that it was dangerous, then they are liable. Yeah, they knew. <laughs> there's, a, there's enough data on that. So a number of questions came in about the radius uh, that is affected by Norlite. And I know that Dr. Bond mentioned uh, 175 square miles. 
someone from Albany is saying, you know, isn't this something that the, um, the greater capital region should be concerned about? How do we get public officials to pay attention to these studies or to commission these studies when there's a denial of the health impacts? Um, a lot of those questions are related to other questions from residents saying, how do I get involved? How do we hold these people accountable? Sign me up. How can everyday residents uh, take some action here? So I think that's the question that we're going to end on. Um, and I, I think, Judith, if you have just a few closing words, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alexis Goldsmith to, uh, to close us out. Well, I know we threw a lot at you, and there's much, much more. <laughs> it was hard to, to summarize. Um, I think the AFFF issue is crucially important. It, Mayor Keeler mentioned that Department of Defense canceled their five-year contract with Norlite, which is great. We were at risk in May of uh, DOD insisting that Norlite take a couple shipments. And when I first heard that from Senator Schumer's office, I thought, wow, I don't want to foist this on another community like in Ohio or Arkansas. Um, and I said, they can't find any place else to take it other than Norlite. And Tradeby actually wrote a letter to Department of Defense and said they reached out to every approved record incinerator qualified to accept this and received rejection notices from all of them based on the volatility and uncertainty of the destruction of PFOS and PFOAS. This is from the incinerator company saying this. So we're in this odd situation where the incinerator companies themselves are backing away from burning PFAS, and a lot of it has to do with Dr. David Bond's study. It is the only study in the whole country that's looked at the impacts of burning PFAS at incinerators. It's been studied in a lab, but little Bennington College did the one and only study in real life. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're in a situation where the Trump Department of Defense canceled this contract. The incinerator companies themselves now have questions. And now we need to know, is Governor Cuomo going to sign the bill to make sure that we have permanent protection? And I would just urge everyone to make that your priority this week. Write, call, use social media. This should be an easy bill for him to sign. Um, but I'm just not sure what's going to happen with the bill. And then Alexis, I believe, has some important information on how people can get involved. Thank you, Judith. Um, first, uh, thank you to all of our panelists tonight, uh, former EPA Region 2 Administrator Judith Ank, co-host Mayor Bill Keeler, Saratoga Sites resident and Syracuse University student Joseph Ritchie, Dr. David Carpenter of SUNY Albany, and Dr. David Bond of Bennington college. So I have some important information uh, for how you can get involved. You'll want to grab a piece of paper and a pen and I can also put it in in the chat but we'll lose the chat as soon as we end the call. So um, the bills that Judith was just referring to are um, Senate Bill 7880B and Assembly Bill 9952B. Those are the bills that would ban AFFF from being burned at Norlight. We're waiting for the governor to sign. Um, we have an email list. You can subscribe to it by writing a request to norlight-subscribe, or it's norlight-subscribe at lists.mayfirst.org. And we have a group that meets every two weeks on Thursday nights. And if you would like the info for that meeting, again, send an email to norlight-subscribe at list.mayfirst.org. You can also email me. My email is goldsmith at mediasanctuary.org. Um, we have a website for the Hudson Mohawk Environmental Action Network that lists the history of Norlight and also the information for how to get involved is there. It's hmean.org. And there's a page for Lights Out Norlight. 
We have a Facebook group that you can join called Lights Out Norlight. Uh, you have to request to, uh, to be admitted to that group, but you just send a, a request there. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Lights Out Norlight. Um, you can contact Joe Ritchie. His number is 518-526-9543. And his email is J R R I T C H I at S Y R dot E D U. Uh, if you want to read more about the Bennington College study, go to Bennington dot E D U slash P F O A. And um, if you have any questions or you know you missed some information, you can send. Um, the Media Sanctuary an email. You can send us an email at info at mediasanctuary.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash mediasanctuary. Alexis, thank you so much for all of that information. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank the Sanctuary for Independent Media um, for hosting this town hall, uh, Lights Out Norlight, and the environmental groups that joined in this evening. Thank you, thank you all, and have a wonderful evening.